Well, hey there, everybody. It's Snackbox coming to you from just a beautiful and sunshiny day here in Basement Studio. That's right. It's sunshiny. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm excited to be here. I'm talking to you today about my biggest fails and mistakes on the backpacking trail that's different than the Oregon Trail or even the Happy Trail. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'll be talking to you today about my biggest fails and mistakes while backpacking and learning to backpack and learning to love the outdoors. We're going to cover everything from some silly mistakes that are pretty laughable to some mistakes that I wish I would have figured out much, much much, much sooner. We've got a lot to cover, not a lot of time. Let's get to it. So before we get too far into this topic, I want to make a couple of key distinctions. And those distinctions have to do with this, the difference between mistakes versus fails, because I don't think of them as the same thing. Mistakes in my mind are things that you can actually live with that are pretty normal. They're common for anybody who's backpacking. If we think about the, the sport as a trial and error sport or hobby or whatever you want to call it, then mistakes are going to happen and they're a normal part of the learning process. By contrast, fails are things that are like major oversights, things that create problems for you that maybe ruin a trip or end a trip early. That kind of thing is what we're going to call fails. But ultimately, in this video, we're going to talk about a little bit of both. And my hope is that a couple of things come out of this video. Number one is that people who are maybe a little nervous or thinking that you're going to need to have everything really figured out before you head out into the woods, that's not necessarily the case. So I want to put your mind at ease and let you know that it's okay if you make a couple of mistakes. Mistakes are not going to be major issues. They're just going to make really great stories. The other thing is, as you're thinking about these fails, think about the things that led to them and the ways that maybe having a little bit more foresight. So kind of finding that sweet spot between over planning and over preparing and sort of stifling yourself that way, and maybe under planning and ending up in situations that you don't want can kind of create issues, right? But ultimately, here's the deal. The best stories come from mistakes and fails. So I'm going to share a few of those with you. I'll try to be short. But you know, sometimes I get carried away. It happens, right? That's the way this works. Let's talk first here about one of my first mistakes. I'm going to qualify this as just a straight up mistake. I thought that I would be totally alone on solo trips. And this was the case sometimes when I went, say, to Yosemite on my first major solo hike. There were a lot of times when I was alone and certainly a couple of days when I was on my own for multiple days. But once I started really getting into some of the more popular trails, it's right there in the description I just gave you. Popular means there are a lot of people. So that's one of the things I really love about the Colorado Trail specifically is that I never go along without seeing people. Now, where this led to a lot of different headaches for me was that I often thought I had to have everything covered and backups on my own just in case I ended up in certain situations. So for one example, when I was on the collegiate loop, which is a 160 mile loop in the center of the Colorado Trail, I ended up carrying four cans of fuel for an eight day hike. That was early, early in my in my hiking days. I carried four of the like the regular size cans of fuel. And I don't know what I was thinking. But by the end of it, I only used up almost one of them, almost one. So one of them would have been more than sufficient. So thinking that I would have been completely alone and without any option should I run out of fuel, that was a pretty big mistake and it sort of made me carry more stuff than I needed, which again, if you've been following the channel at all, you know the number one mistake new hikers make is carrying too much stuff or too heavy stuff. That one really led me to carrying quite a bit too much stuff throughout my early days of backpacking. And I've now gotten the confidence to know that I'll be able to figure out problems should I forget something. And a lot of times one of the things is that the community is so good, especially on the more popular trail that if you mess up and miss something, you're going to be able to find somebody who'll be able to help you out. Of course, you don't want to go into the woods with not the right stuff, but you want to make sure that you go in knowing that ultimately, if you forgot one little thing or two little things, it's going to be fine. You're going to be okay. Now, this is one of my fails, and this is one of my favorite stories of all time. And this, this is the story here is that I went with my little brother. We went to the Everglades National Park, and we were on a canoe trip. And the Everglades had these things called chickies, which are super cool. They're what the Miccosukee Indians used to use when they were paddling around the mangrove forest and they're basically open water docks you can camp on. They are incredible. I'll have to do a video about them at some point because they're just one of the best hidden gems in the National Park Service. They are really cool. You can rent a canoe and paddle out to them. And my brother and I had done a couple of different trips out to the Everglades and done some paddling trips and adventures out that way. And there was one trip where we decided we were going to stay in the open water. Now we left the visitor center in Flamingo, which is the very southern tip of Florida. And we had to paddle straight out and kind of hang a left and and there was an island in the way. And basically, here's the story. We paddled just a little bit and we noticed the tide was starting to go out. And in the distance between South Florida and Key West, it never gets more than six feet deep. So when the tide goes out, it goes out 
really, really fast. We were watching, so we were watching this tide zip underneath our boat. Like literally we're watching the water sink and we're watching the, the sand come up to us. It's the tide's leaving faster than most bathtubs drain. That's not an exaggeration. It's not hyperbole. It literally was just draining, draining, draining. About 20 minutes from when we left the visitor station, we ended up on a sandbar. We were stuck on the mud for four hours while we waited for the tide to come back in. We got out and tried to push it a little bit and we sunk immediately to our waist in the mud. Basically, we ended up sitting within eyeshot, mind you. We could hear people at the visitor center talking about us. We sat there in the mud for four hours playing cards, waiting for the tide to come back in. Ultimately, it worked out okay, but it was a pretty hilarious story and we both got pretty sunburned that day. So it was a pretty great adventure or a pretty big fail. I don't know, you make the decision. Let me know in the comments below. Now, the next thing that I did, and this is just a straight up mistake that I made. And, and I'm gonna show you a picture here. This is me on the top of Angel's Landing in Zion. It's a great hike if you get permits to do it. I think you need permits now. I did it before the permit system really came into play and the, the hike was really cool. But what I want you to notice in this picture is that I'm wearing giant boots. I'm talking giant boots. These are Vasques and I thought they were the way to go. If I was a serious hiker, I thought I need serious shoes. The idea here is actually that's kind of counterintuitive, but you want lighter shoes because every step you take, you have to swing all the weight that's tied to your foot. You have to swing that. So it's really, really hard. And it's hard on the knees. It's hard on your body. And for me, it created some blister situations that I really could have avoided. So my thought was that if I'm on a bigger hike, I need bigger boots, I need bigger gear, more burly, whatever. And the truth is the bigger the hike, the less gear you want or the lighter the gear you want. So that was a really big one for me. And so the first thing I did was I got rid of those boots and I got myself a pair of trail runners and paired it with some trekking poles. And that one's gonna come into play in the next one here. And those trekking poles are really important because I've talked to a lot of folks and I've said, listen, trekking poles are a game changer. I got a pair and I loved them. I used to use a big walking stick and now I'm using a trekking pole. And people will say the same thing that I used to say. And I would always say, no, no, no. I don't wanna be that person that's out there with a pair of trekking poles. Do you see them? They look ridiculous. And the truth is, no, nobody looks ridiculous. You're in the middle of the back country. You're going to see a handful of people. So to my first point, you're not going to be completely alone, but everybody is carrying trekking poles. You're going to fit in fine. And who cares what you look like? You know, it's worse than having trekking poles in your hand is having knees that don't work anymore make your choice. So anyway, basically what happened here is I, I decided that there were certain pieces of gear that I thought were sort of silly and I didn't want. So trekking poles or that big walking stick, I thought I was going to be sort of old fashioned. I even used an external frame backpack as late as 2014, if you can believe it. So I was really sort of stubborn about my gear and I wanted people to think that I was like a really serious hiker. And the truth is I just made myself really uncomfortable a lot. That external frame backpack was super top heavy. So I fell into multiple rivers, multiple multiple rivers. Rivers. Just every time I'd see a river crossing in the Sierra Nevada, I would go face first in because the minute I'd lose my balance, top of that pack would just push my face straight into the water. And I still didn't learn for a long time. But basically caring how I looked was something that created a lot of headache for me. So that was a pretty big mistake for me. And then finally, here's my last mistake. And this is more of a philosophical thing. And, and, and it's something that I think for a lot of people could be a real game changer or for many people who have already sort of figured this out has been a game changer. And that's the idea that when I'm getting ready for a big hike, I initially started to think a lot about comfort in camp. So I would think about things like, how's my tent going to be? Is it going to be enough room for me? Is it is my sleeping bag going to be soft enough? Is my sleeping bag going to be warm enough? And those are all important considerations to be sure. You want to make sure that you are able to get a good night's rest. But the key here is a lot of times what we do is we make decisions based on how we're going to be comfortable in camp. We take things like big, heavy camp chairs. We take things like books for reading those heavier things that we take so that we can be comfortable in camp. And the problem on a hiking trip is often that that ignores the fact that you're going to spend a lot more time awake and on the trail carrying that stuff than you are in camp sitting in it. In fact, even though you're in camp for maybe eight to 10 hours a night, the truth is you're only awake for a handful of those. So if you take a camp chair, for example, you have to carry that camp chair for upwards of 10 to 12 hours on a through hike, but you only really sit in it for an hour or two at the end of the night at most. So unless you really need it, some people do for things like, hip injuries or knee injuries, but unless you really need it, you don't absolutely have to carry those heavier things. So when I talk about this mistake, I think about the things that I used to carry and I used to carry things like books. I used to carry flashlights. I took multiple books with me, not saying like I took one book on multiple trips. I'm saying I took three or four books on different trips because I wanted to make sure I had a book. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about when I say,
say that I used to think a lot about comfort in camp rather than comfort on the trail. And so making that adjustment made a huge difference for me. That basically covers it. These are a couple of different mistakes and fails and sort of thought processes that I went through that I wish I could have changed sooner. But the truth is it made me who I am as a hiker and it made me really aware of the things and the decisions that I make when I'm buying new gear and packing up a pack. So what I want to know from you are what were your biggest fails or mistakes? Leave a comment below and let me know about it. I think it's really important for us as a hiking community to share those places where we might have made a mistake or we might have done something that's not so great because it can make it a lot less intimidating for those new folks who are joining the flock and really thinking about whether or not they want to carry certain things or how they want to approach hiking or what they want to do. If we make it really an open community where everybody has a sense of humor about those mistakes, I think it makes it better for everybody. So let me know in the comments below. Also, be sure to hit me up on Instagram at Backcountry Champion. Send me a message and say, hey, Snackbox, hit me up with one of those outside comfort zone stickers and I will get one in the mail to you immediately. I'll send one out to you just to say thanks for watching the channel. You don't even have to follow me on Instagram. Just send me the message. Say, hey, here's my address. Send me a sticker and I'll be glad to get one in the mail to you. If you haven't already, be sure to click that like and subscribe button and be sure you join us here Sunday night at seven. We're going to be talking about trail towns. We're going to be talking about resupply. We're going to be talking about all the things transportation wise going into the through hike of the Colorado Trail. Love to have you join me. You can send over questions already and let me know what kind of things you want to know about. And we're going to make sure that as you start planning for your Colorado Trail through hike, you are in a great position to be successful. So let me know what those are below. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care, everybody. This snack box out. Multiple, 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 multiple rivers.